Hey folks, welcome to a new feature here on Passion for Sound. Today's video is the first in a series of what I'm going to be calling the Sound Decision Series. And this is all about providing some simple and helpful information to support your decisions when you're out there buying DACs or amps or earphones or headphones. It's more about the theory behind what makes a good product as opposed to reviews of product itself. To kick the series off, I was fortunate enough to be able to arrange a video call with Rob Watts. Now Rob Watts is the designer of Cord Electronics DACs. Uh, he's quite well known in the industry, a, a leader in the way that he approaches DAC design. And so I asked Rob to share with us his views on the different sorts of DACs out there, the reason he chose to do DAC design the way that he does for Cord Electronics, and also then to explore what makes Cord DACs sound the way they do, what, what he's done in terms of the filtering process, how it compares to MQA, and various other questions that I think will be helpful and interesting to anybody looking to buy a DAC in the future. Now it was a long interview, it went for about an hour and a half all up, so what I've done is I've chopped it into pieces. This is part one, the other parts will follow in the coming weeks. And what I'll try and do is intersperse some comments along the way, because obviously speaking to an expert like Rob, it's in terms of knowledge and information, it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. So my intention is that as I share the information in the video, I'll put in little on text comments, but I also might pause the video and actually share some comments myself to reflect on what I heard from Rob and what I've made of it, the, the understanding that I've taken away after the fact and when I've thought more about the conversation with Rob Watts. So without any further delay, let's jump into an interview with Rob Watts. So the first question I had was that my awareness is that there are three types of DACs basically in the yes. world. Delta Sigma, R2R or non-oversampling, and then there's the FPGA type. Is that accurate? Kind of. Um, I mean, you've got, you've really got two types. You've got Delta Sigma and you've got R2R. If you're not familiar with Delta Sigma and R2R or NOS DACs as they're sometimes called, which is non-oversampling, what it all means is that an R2R DAC or a NOS DAC takes the signal and essentially tries to directly reproduce that signal from the digital directly to the analog. Uh, and it does that through a series of resistors, which is what's called an R2R resistor to resistor. The difference between that and a DSD DAC is that a DSD DAC actually takes the signal and processes it as a one bit, or as Rob's gonna explain shortly, sometimes a three, four or five bit signal as opposed to a full 16-bit or 24-bit signal like an R2R does. I'll let Rob explain why he believes one is better than the other, but what you need to know for the sake of this is that there are fans in both camps. There are some people that like the purity of R2R because they believe not going through that filtering and reconstruction process of throwing away all those bits is beneficial, whereas there are others who say the DSD approach is better because it is actually creating a cleaner end output despite the reduction in the bit depth. And as I said, I'll let Rob explain that more. Pulse Array, my DAC technology is a type of Delta Sigma. Okay. When you look into Delta Sigma itself, you then have two major types that discriminate everything. And one being DSD, which is one bit. Mm -hmm. And the second type is um, N-bit. So you have an N-bit output. So typically four or five bits, something like okay. that. Um, and there's quite a, theoretically, there's quite a big difference between a one bit and an n bit. Okay. Because of the way the, the modulators actually work. So there's huge problems with one bits um, in that the modulator, it's very easy to go unstable. This might be. And of course, you've got all, 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 all the chip DACs um, that, that are Delta Sigma, they're pretty much all of them n bit. And, and they might oh, be. Are they? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they might be switch capacitor networks, they might be switch resistors, they might be switch current sources. The, the decision that the chip designer uses to do his architecture, will, there's lots of different ways of actually implementing your four or five bits okay. on, your, on your output. So when we look at a, a DAC that's got a, a Sabre chip or a Cirrus Logic or an AKM, most of those are yes. N-bit approaches. They're, they're all N-bit, Delta okay. Sigma. Um, typically, they run at around three megahertz for the noise shaper, um, um, but they're all basically n bit. Um, okay. It was really strange about um, uh, how DSD came about because in the early days, and I'm talking about before '95, um, you you had a simple choice if you wanted to create a DAC. 
you would either buy an R2R back chip from Philips, mm -hmm. or you'd buy a one bit Delta Sigma, and they call it PDM, which is pulse density modulation. You'd either buy one of those chips, um, and you play around and, and, and get the best performance that you could get in terms of measurements and sound quality. <clears throat> so that was the choice that you had. Then in the mid 90s, some inductor chip suppliers started to go away from DSD or PDM um, because of these problems that DSD has got. Um, mm. It's got this instability issue. You've got the fact that every single mm. DSD device, when it's converting into analog, will create distortion and noise. Um, you have gurgle tones, you have modulation noise, you have all hosts of different, different problems. And to solve those issues, you went to an M-bit structure. Um, and then towards the end of the 90s, of course, Sony Philips created DSD, which was a backward step in that the semiconductor companies had rejected DSD as a way forward. Um, but suddenly they wanted to go for, for DSD. So DSD was actually a backward step in terms of how you convert from digital to analog. And then, of course, the whole DSD thing came about, and um, I, I was busy rejecting DSD um, in, in 95, which is when I created my own um, DAC conversion technology, the Pulse Array. I asked Rob at this point for his opinion on why DSD may have been chosen despite the flaws that he's just mentioned. And essentially my understanding from what I've read and also speaking to Rob is that it all comes down to the amount of data required. So a DSD signal is essentially taking just under 3 million samples every single second. To do that at any level of bit depth would just require so much data, particularly back in the 90s when memory was not as readily available as it is today, it was just prohibitive to think about taking three or four bits worth of data 3 million times per second. Even now, if you look at a DSD file, they are so much larger than a regular PCM file, like a FLAC, for instance, that that was really the limiting factor, as I understand it. I was really interested to share with some of the viewers what each of the DACs does well, because obviously they're out there for a reason. They do some things well, um, but they've also got their drawbacks. So if we maybe start with where it all began back with R2R, can we start with the pros? What, in your mind, in isolation, what would you say that R2R DACs do particularly well? Uh, they don't do anything particularly well. Okay, um, <laughs> that's not a good start. <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the pros of an R2R DAC is that if you're a, um, a designer and you want to design your own DAC technology um, and you don't want to cre create your own chip, then it's very easy to create an R2R DAC okay. that works. Mm -hmm. that doesn't measure well but physically works because yep. you just get a bag full of resistors you make sure your resistors are, are, are very high tolerance very mm -hmm. low tolerance um, very accurate resistors you get a bag full of FETs and then you, you can design your own R2R DAC fairly easily getting half decent measure performance is an incredibly difficult difficult process okay. because R2R DACs suffer from the fact that your, your tolerances are, you know, they need to be completely matched. The fact that your FETs that you're using for switching the different resistors in and out, the timing of those FETs needs to be matched. How you drive it needs to be matched. The parasitic capacitance that happen with the FETs and the resistors, these all have big effects in terms of the glitch energy that you get coming out. The glitch energy is noise and, and signal correlated. So that creates distortion as well. So there's a horrendous number of problems that okay. you've got with R2R. The glitch energy that Rob speaks about here is essentially the, the leftover signal or the, the electronic noise, if you like, that's created with any kind of switching component within a circuit. And he talks about it later as parasitic as well. Um, so both of those terms, as I understood it from Rob, are fairly interchangeable. And essentially what you're referring to is that when there's electronic components switching, they tend to produce noise, and that noise is getting dumped into the signal itself and therefore creating distortion. But if you want to not use somebody else's chip and you know, say that you, you've created your own DAC, then an R2R DAC is a very simple way of doing it. Right, okay. Delta Sigma is more complicated because you need to understand how to design noise shapers. That, that can be done using MATLAB. You could use MATLAB and create your own noise shapers from, from MATLAB. I mean, it's not really creating your own noise shaper. You're, 
who are using MATLAB to create the coefficients for you. But you can do filters with MATLAB. You can do no, even noise shapers with MATLAB. They, they will create the coefficients for you. Um, and then you can model your performance. And then when you've got your coefficients, you then have to convert that into code that something will work on. And that you're limited to two, two things there. FPGAs, which are fill programmable gate arrays, and that's creating your own logic, or DSP. So you can use DSP cores um, and um, run with your own noise shapers and, 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 and do it that way. DSP is less flexible because you, you don't have the ability to do things that you can do with FPGAs. With FPGAs, you've got hundreds of thousands worth of gates. You could mm -hmm. do tens of thousands of things in parallel. With a, a DSP core, you're limited to the number of processors and having to do things sequentially. Um, yep. So you're fairly restricted on, on, on doing it. Just to clarify what Rob's saying here, the FPGA technology he's talking about is essentially a chip that you buy that is a blank slate and you can program it to do whatever you want if you've got the skill and the expertise in coding FPGAs. Um, and they're generally more powerful than your standard off-the-shelf DAC chip. They've got the ability to be programmed to do all kinds of things and multiple things at once. The contrast when he's talking about DSP is about digital sound processing and that's often using dedicated chips that are designed for that purpose but have far less power. Um, now again there's a lot more detail to that that's beyond my understanding but the point that Rob's making here is that you either need to have the ability to work like Chord and PS Audio do with FPGAs, which takes a lot of skill, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of time to produce the code, or you do an off-the-shelf system, which uses the DSP and a, an off-the-shelf DAC chip. And in doing that, you're limiting your options because there's less power and less flexibility available. So you're looking at having to have DSP skills or FPGA skills, mm. as well as the MATLAB skills or the other ability of understanding how to create a noise shaper. As mentioned before, when a Delta Sigma DAC does the processing of the audio, it actually is reducing a, let's say, a 16-bit signal down to maybe three, four or five bits. What that means is that it's reducing the dynamic range in the signal for the purpose of processing. So the output is going to be recovered but for the processing, it's actually reducing the dynamic range of the signal, and that produces a lot of noise. So when Rob's talking here about noise shapers, what the noise shaper's job is to do is to filter out the noise created by shrinking a waveform that might be that high. When it's been compressed down to that, it produces a degree of errors and noise. It's often referred to as quantization noise. And so the noise shaper's job is to filter and remove that noise so that it doesn't interfere with the end resulting signal. And that's why a DSD DAC can be cleaner than an R2R DAC, because all of that noise is getting filtered out by the noise shaper, so long as the noise shaper is done well, as Rob talks about. This is fundamentally much more difficult and complicated to do than an R2R DAC, which is relatively easy for somebody to right. do. So what's interesting is subjectively, having just reviewed the, um, there's a mass drop product, the Aorist R2R, having just reviewed <coughs> that and previously having used the shit gun year multi-bit as my sort of reference stack for a long time. And I say reference <laughs> meaning not as a test thing so much as the DAC that of everything I'd tried to date, I enjoyed the most and therefore was my go-to. This is what I enjoy. Subjectively, I prefer both of those R2R DACs to most Delta Sigma DACs that I've heard. Is there something that an R2R DAC is doing that's leading to that subjective preference for some people? And, and, and the short answer to that was, was, was no. That okay. the, only, the, the only benefit that an R2R got, uh, as DAC has got is it doesn't have a noise shaper in it. Well, okay. generally they don't have noise shapers in it. And designing noise shapers to be transparent is a hugely complicated and difficult task. Mm -hmm. Um, so but there is the possibility that with an R2R DAC, and if you manage to get the resistors correct, that you might be able to reproduce small signals a little bit more accurately, but I don't see any justification for that in, in that the measurements that, that you see for small signal accuracy on an R2R DAC is pretty awful. Mm. Um, and um, a, a chip Delta Sigma DAC will be much better in terms of how accurately it reconstructs small signals. So I'm at a, I'm at a loss. I, I don't understand. Whenever I've heard of R2R DACs, that, that the kind of DACs you've been talking about, yep. 
I, I never got it. To me, they just sounded flat, distorted, bright, over analytical. Yeah, <laughs> I just don't understand why people would would, uh, would actually see that as being a good sound quality. Because that's so funny. Because my experience would be almost the opposite, where I've found the the Artuar DAX that I mentioned, the the Aerist Artuar and the the shit Gumby. When I've put them up next to Delta Sigma DAX, I've consistently found the Delta Sigma DAX have felt the sound stage has felt flatter. Um, and, okay. And therefore, I've enjoyed the more natural sense of space in the sound yeah. compared to yeah. the Delta Sigmas. Um, I'm, I'm, I must. I mean, you've got much more experience of listening to other DACs. I mean, I've only ever listened to one R to R DAC. Okay. In the last five years. Right. Um, okay. Yep. And and so so my experience. I'm not interested in what the competitors are doing. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it's what I'm doing is what I'm doing, and I've got very good reasons for doing what I'm doing. Yep. And I'm certain about what I'm doing is the right way forward. So of course I understand the technology that the competitors are using. And I'm more interested in that than their actual sound quality. Mm, mm. Um, the downside of R2R DAX is that you have distortion extending up to infinite frequencies. Mm, mm. And the other th problem you have with R2R DAX is that distortion is always the same. So if you've got the signal there, you've got your distortion here. And as the signal decreases, the distortion stays the same. Right. The same kind of level. And you end up with a situation mm. where eventually your distortion is much bigger than your, your, your signal. Um, and that's very audible. And the benefit you have with, with Delta Sigma is that the distortion is like this, and it tends to be less high harmonics, it tends to float down naturally. But as you reduce it, the distortion comes down. Okay. You do have a problem with chip DACs in that there's always some element of distortion staying there. And as the signal gets smaller, you still have distortion coming through. Yep. Okay. Because of noise on the substrate that's signal correlated leaching through onto the analog section, and you just can't remove that. Mm. The benefit that I've got with, with my solution is that we've got one chip that's doing the noise shaping and doing all the digital processing. That's the FBGA. And the conversion to analog is, is done by a discrete set of components. Mm. And so that you can completely isolate the two domains from one another. Um, well, not completely, but you can isolate the two domains from one another. Um, and so you don't have noise corruption going through and upsetting the analog components in the same way you do it on a chip DAC. Yep. Because you haven't got a common substrate. Okay. And then, of course, the major problem you have is that you can never get the tolerances to be accurate enough. Yep. So you're looking at R2R. Generally, they're using 0.01% resistors. That's mm -hmm. a minus 80 dB performance level. So if you want 144 dB performance, then you're looking at, you know, numbers 0. 0.000 yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. one tolerance which is just impossible to get from a yep. resistor um and of course what what i'm trying to do is that when i get my noise shapers to work i'm getting 64 bit accuracy or 350 mm -hmm. degrees mm -hmm. so if we wanted to do that i mean it would just be completely impossible. impossible yeah tolerances would be would be huge yeah so that's the end of part one now to start with i just want to clarify a few things that i've taken from this conversation one of them is that like any designer in the industry, Rob has very specific ways that he views the technology uh, and the theory behind what he does. So I wanna make it clear that I'm not endorsing Rob's approach and the things Rob's saying here as the only answer when it comes to digital audio. There are others out there like DCS that Rob mentioned, um, like PS Audio, like Shit, that are doing their own version and doing it well enough that there are people all around the industry that love the products. So I did wanna stress that I'm not endorsing Rob's approach as the only approach. The other thing I wanted to mention is that what I've taken from this is that whilst the discussions here would suggest that R2R DAX like the shit Gumby, like the Aorist R2R, whilst technically they may be flawed from a noise point of view, there is no doubt in my mind still that a really well-made R2R can outperform from a subjective point of view some other DSD DACs, just as some DSD DACs built to a certain level of quality can outperform R2R. So it's not to say that one DAC technology is automatically better than the other. As with everything, it all comes down to how well it's put together. It's no different to automotive design where everybody's using engines in their cars. Some might use a boxer engine, some might use a six cylinder or a four cylinder or a diesel or a petrol. They're all different approaches 
And one diesel is not necessarily better than one petrol. It all depends on how it's put together and how well the engineers work on it. So I think that's really important to take away from this. Rob's view is that R2R is inferior, but I do believe that a really well-designed R2R up to a certain level can match or exceed some, not all, but some DSD designs. And a lot of that will come down to what Rob was talking about, that an off-the-shelf chip-based DSD DAC is sometimes limited by the quality of the DSP, the quality of the filtering, and the noise shaping that is built into it by the company working on it. Now in the remaining parts of this interview, Rob goes on to talk about how his filtering works to reconstruct the sound effectively, why his DACs are different to others in terms of the amount of that reconstruction that's going on, how it compares to MQA, and a little bit about understanding sampling rates and upsampling and the impact that they have on what we can hear and how we hear it even though obviously our hearing is limited to less than 20 kilohertz and down to maybe 20 hertz, why higher sampling rates than 44.1 can actually make a difference. So if you found part one interesting and you haven't subscribed already, do hit that subscribe button, hit the bell if you wanna know when the next video comes out, and I look forward to seeing you here next time on Passion for Sound.